All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to go kayaking. It's probably a terrible idea. Uh, the water's been so low and so clear all summer long. I mean, it's July 21st, so hasn't been a lot of summer, but enough summer for me to be grumpy about it. Uh, it's just hard to fish for smallmouth when the water's really low and clear because they can see you coming, especially in a kayak. Uh, it's one thing if you can wade and get close without them seeing you, but when you blow over top of fish in a kayak, like there's just no, there's nothing you can do. I mean, so we're gonna try a couple things today, try to uh, stack the odds in our favor. One of the things we're doing is fishing a clear intermediate fly line now that purpose that's got two purposes there it's clear so you're not throwing a big shadow over top of the water when you false casting and that's something i think that people don't realize how i don't want to say dangerous but how uh counterproductive false casting is like if you false cast out over fish two three four five six times they know there's stuff going on above them. Like, what's your typical fish's number one predator? Especially, like, something like smallmouth. Birds. Birds are above them. You know, things get crazy above them. They look up, and they say, oh, I'm out of here. You know? So if you flip a big eight-weight weight forward line over top of a bunch of fish over and over and over and over, they're going to take note. And I, I know there's a, there's a big argument about, well, fish can't tell what fly line is. Fish don't care about fly line. And while when we're talking about, you know, the color of fly line or, you know, the diameter of fly line, sure, maybe if there's a bright orange fly line on the water, the difference between that and a, uh, you know, a more neutral colored fly line might not, there might not be a big difference there. But if we're talking about direct sunlight and the shadow you're making, from false casting over top of fish, fly line definitely makes a difference. So it doesn't really matter, even in, even something like a clear intermediate line, it's still gonna have a shadow, it's still gonna make a, a shadow over top of fish you false cast. But I'm just trying to minimize that as much as possible. Also, another thing, and this is one of those things that's easier said than done, is stop false casting seven, eight, nine times. Like, if you, especially if you're fishing big water for something like smallmouth, and this is, you know, you fish saltwater much, you have to learn to do this. Big double hauls, you need to put a lot of line out really quick. So instead of, you know, cast, 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 oh, that's about enough. You got to haul, haul, cast, and that's it. You know, two big hauls, get enough line out, and you're done. And that's... It's not an easy thing to learn. A good double haul is, oh, watch out. A good double haul is, is hard to learn. Um, it's something that you don't always need to do. Like, you, especially if you fish for something like trout and you're not fishing big rivers. You don't need to be blasting half your fly line out in a caster, in a, you know, a false caster too. But if you're, especially if you're fishing saltwater and you got to be able to put flies on a target as quickly as possible. And I think it really helps for things like big water, smallmouth, or even largemouth if you're you're fishing. I don't know a lot of people that fly fish for largemouth on big bodies of water. But if you do, I mean, again, being able to get a fly out as quickly and efficiently as possible without spooking any fish in the process. Oh, man, I'm not going to make it through this light. Anyway. You want to get the fly out as quickly and efficiently as possible. And not spooking fish in the process is great. So, minimizing false casting as much as you can. It's one of those things, even I, I catch myself doing it, you know. I want to perfect that, my cast. So, you know, I'm dialing it in. Four false casts, five. I'm like, what am I doing, you know. You do not need six, seven, eight false casts. All that aside, what we're going to try and focus on today is using 
light, smaller, lighter flies, smaller, lighter line. And uh, the second advantage to using an intermediate line as opposed to a floating line, even though we're fishing very, not very shallow, but relatively shallow bodies of water here, uh, you want to get your flies down. Especially hot summer. Well, this is, I was going to say afternoon. This is uh, morning, more or less. It's nine. So fish may or may not be up near the surface, but in water like this, the difference between the surface and the bottom of the creek is only, you know, a foot or two. So being able to make sure you get that fly down to the bottom, shake it in their face, no matter what, is really helpful. And it also gives you the ability to fish lighter or even non-weighted flies and let the line drag them under instead of having to fish, you know, clouser minnows with weighted eyes or something with a cone head or, you know, any kind of big weighted fly. And uh, the advantage there is, one, it's easier to cast. Um, casting big weighted flies sucks. Everybody knows that. You ever smack yourself in the back of the head with a clouser minnow, you know that sucks. I'm going to smack myself like right here in the back of the arm, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. And it got me so... I didn't get the hook, thank God. But it smacked me so hard, it like sent shivers through my whole body. Like everybody knows, once you smack yourself with a fly like that once, you think twice about how you fish big, heavy-weighted flies. Um, but that's another nice thing about something like an intermediate line, is you can fish very lightly weighted flies, like maybe a woolly bugger with a little wire wrap. Just enough weight to help it start to sink, and then the intermediate line will drag it down. And even completely weightless flies, you power them out as far as you can, let the intermediate, let the line drag them down underwater as you strip them back to you. So it's a, it's a versatile tool, great for hot summer clear water. That's one of my favorite times to use it for smallmouth. Salt water, it's something you want to use a little, a lot more often than not, I think. Um, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about smallmouth in the summer when it's hot, when the water's low and clear. So truthfully, I've been watching the gauge on this particular body of water, and it was up high uh, two, three days ago, and it's just emptying out so quick just because everything around here is so dry. As soon as we get pounded with rain, like it's like it just all gets absorbed into the ground and none of it makes it back into the water system. It sucks. Got a whole little camera rig going on here. It's kind of a mess. So we're going to be bouncing around a little bit. Yep, yep. But we're going to try, see what we can do. Um, this is one of those things where, like, this is the best chance I've had to get out in decent conditions in a month or two. So got to try it, I guess. Probably going to end up walking the kayaks a bunch, but you'll have this. Right now, I'm driving to meet the wife at our takeout point so we can set up the whole shuttle deal. Tell you what sucks, and this is something to take into a take into account if you're buying kayaks or thinking about buying kayaks. We only have one vehicle with a roof rack. So her car is a little Toyota Corolla, and you can't put kayaks on top of it unless you buy a roof rack for it. But like a good roof rack for a little compact sedan like that, not cheap, relatively. So what we usually end up doing is we'll put the kayaks on my car, drop her car off at the end, we get to the end, somebody will jump in that car, come back and get my car, which sucks. I mean, it's the most inefficient thing possible. It's not a good time, but I'm cheap. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's easier than buying another, or buying a roof rack. But, uh, yeah, that's, transporting kayaks is not a good time. But, not, I digress, we're not here to talk about kayaks. We'll maybe do another video on that some other time. Because I love fishing from a kayak. I love fly fishing from a kayak. It is a different world compared to fly fishing or even fishing with a spinning rod or a bait caster out of a kayak just because you got so much more going on with a fly rod and fly line that you got to deal with especially like line management where do you keep a nine foot fly rod in a ten and a half foot boat stuff like that but uh yeah let's see if we can get something done in low clear water 
using smaller flies, lighter flies, and a clear intermediate line to move those flies. So let's, let's get out on the water, see what we can see. So we are starting things off with a little crayfish imitation. This is got bead chain eyes. So like I said, a lighter fly than something I might normally fish on a floating line. Again, with a clear intermediate line. Well, I made a mistake, um, amateur mistake. I thought that because the gauge said one thing, the conditions would be another thing. And my bad, that just isn't the case. The gauge should really only tell you water level. And I assumed it would mean condition, and it did not. Uh, the water is not that clear. It has definitely got a little tannic stain to it. It's not chocolate milk and it's not bad. I mean, I can see the bottom everywhere, but uh, yeah, I definitely thought the water was gonna be clear. Doesn't make fishing a intermediate line a problem? No, um, but I probably would have brought an aggressively tapered floating line <laughs> had I known. Um, the problem with a lot of, especially uh, lower line weight, intermediate lines is they are level, meaning they don't have a taper. So they're harder to cast, generally. Geese wiling out over here. This is a six weight I'm casting this on, and it is, uh, it's definitely a different feeling to cast it because it's level instead of having a taper. You have to kind of pay attention, keep tension on your cast. You can't rely on the weight of a heavily tapered line to carry your, your cast. But we're still going to try and see if we can't pick us some fish out. I ditched the crayfish. Nope. Oh, hold on. And instead I'm fishing this guy. This is a, oh gosh, I'm going to hit this log. We're cool. <laughs> this is a, oh, I hit it. A black woolly bugger of my own devising with an extra long tail. Gives you some wiggle, kind of like Kind of like a plastic worm, which we all know in bass fishing is always good. So let's see if we can put that in a fish's face. Got a fish. Finally. Healthy, too. Good one, too. Finally. Come here, you big. Oh, hey now. Be cool. Be cool.
There's a fish. <laughs> Big enough. Well, that's that. I uh, eventually gave in, tied on a clouser minnow because I know it's my go-to and I know it'll work and was able to get it down deep with that intermediate line. And in the summer, I think that's what you got to do. You got to fish deep and you got to fish slow and you just got to find where the fish are because they're not everywhere, unfortunately. And uh, using an intermediate line really did help, I think. So something worth investing in. All right. So intermediate fly lines, what did we learn? First of all, we learned it, we got off the creek at the right time because it just started pouring. Um, it's a great tool to have in your arsenal. Are you gonna fish with it every day? No, nor, nor should you, but it has a lot of great application. If you wanna get out and throw streamers for trout, it's a great way to get a little extra depth. If you want to, oh geez, hold on. Drag flies a little bit deeper than you'd ordinarily be able to. It's a great way to do that. Like it's great for smallmouth. It is a staple for saltwater fishing usually, depending on what you're doing. So good tool to have. Also, and I always, always recommend this, get yourself some extra spools for your reel. Slap that intermediate line on, you're good to go. You don't have to mess with another reel, another rod. You're all set up. Today I was using a Reddington ID. Not a fancy reel, not a high performance reel, relatively inexpensive. You can put the cool decals on it. I've got a donut on mine because I like donuts. I'm very easy to please. Uh, but you can get spools for like 40 bucks. And if you've, look, if you've looked at spools for any reel, you know $40 is a steal for whatever. So that is why I really like that reel. I've got like five or six spools for it. So I got an intermediate line, a regular old weight forward floating line, a super aggressive tapered weight forward like saltwater line. I've got a sink tip, I've got a full sink. So all you gotta do is pop a new spool in, which is so much easier than carrying around another reel and rod. So buy yourself some spools. Uh, because intermediate lines are somewhat of a specialty tool, uh, there's just a niche that not everybody's into. I often find good deals on them on eBay. Like fly shops I think will have them sitting on the shelf for a long time. Like a fly shop in central Pennsylvania, they're not going to sell a lot of, that's where I'm at, you're not going to sell a lot of intermediate lines because people aren't generally looking for that. Around here, most people fly fish for trout. Some people, smallmouth, but most people are fishing for trout. This is good trout fishing. So the amount of times you're going to use an intermediate line to fish for trout, like not too often. I do it because I have an intermediate line and like if I'm going to fish streamer specifically, and I know I'm gonna be in an area where I wanna drag a streamer deep without too much weight on it. But either way, check eBay. Uh, I was using a Cortland, I think it's a, from like a 333 series or the 444 series. I got it on eBay for like 20 bucks, 15 bucks, like dirt, dirt cheap. Like if you wanna go out and buy a brand new Rio Intermediate line, it's probably gonna be $100. And like for something that you're not gonna use all the time, screw that. Like, I, I get that. Paying for fly lines is a joke. Like, I was looking through my reels last night, looking for this intermediate line. And it just, you know, it adds up quick. You know, you need an eight weight, you need a six weight, you need a five weight, a four weight, a 10 weight. So there's a hundred bucks here, a hundred bucks there, a hundred bucks there. You know, time you're all said and done, you might as well buy a motorcycle. Like, fly lines suck. Buying them retail sucks so bad. So do yourself a favor, next time you're shopping for a fly line, check out eBay. I buy lots and lots of fly lines on eBay. Almost every fly line I buy comes from eBay. Unless like I need it in a hurry or it's a super specialty item. Even Skagit heads, I buy Skagit, I'll, I'll buy used Skagit heads. Like I'm just trying to save a buck because fly fishing is freaking expensive. Anything you can do to 
just knock a little bit of that cost off helps. So, intermediate lines have uh, that you know there's a place and a time for them. If you got one, you got a spool, throw that in your bag, you're ready to go. Come to a place and a time when you want to drag a fly down just a little deeper. Great, it's a great tool for that. And there is something to be said about the fact that you can get clear intermediate lines. You're gonna cast less of a shadow with your line. Oh, that's a big pothole, hold on. Cast less of a shadow with that line. A little bit less of a signature in the water for sure. And now there are arguments to be made about that, but this is neither here nor there. Something clear is definitely less intrusive than something that's bright orange or chartreuse. I mean, that you gotta be an idiot to disagree with that. So arguments about fly lines of visibility, notwithstanding. It definitely gives you something. It doesn't have to be clear. I think Rio or Scientific Anglers has a camouflage intermediate line, which looks cool. And it just, you know, it's a breaks up the the look of the line. So any and you I mean there are intermediate lines out there that are bright yellow. <laughs> My that I've got a an eleven weight, I think it's an airflow tarpon intermediate line that is blue. I mean Obviously, it would be fished in blue water, but still, it's not clear. Regardless, check eBay, get yourself some new spools, and try an intermediate line. If you can pick them up cheap, and it is a great tool to have for fishing just a little deeper than you normally would with a floating line. Now, it does have its own unique problems. You can't mend line. Line, manage, line management is a lot different because your line is underwater. Like, it's not as crazy as fishing a full sinking line. Fishing a full sinking line is another world. It's not enjoyable <laughs> just because line management is so difficult because your line is always on the bottom of the body of water you're fishing. All right, made it home. So, moral of the story, try it on an intermediate line. It might just be what you need to give you that extra edge you need on the fish. Thanks for watching me babble for like 20 minutes.